All right, hey, how's it going, everybody? Just gonna check this out. Uh, my name is Greg Brown from Foundry, and this is another Canova live stream, webinar, whatever you wanna call it. And today we're actually gonna be going through a couple things. And thanks for joining us if you were here last week, uh, or if you saw the video from last week, it was quite a debacle. Uh, a lot of problems occurred, and we're gonna kind of, uh, we corrected those problems, we're gonna take it uh, from this point forward, all right? And we're gonna go over a couple things today. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna first go over is the ability to actually do mixed reality live streams using Canova and how you set that up. And when we started working on Canova, we immediately talked about how cool it would be to show people what it's like to actually work in virtual reality um, by compositing a real world camera and a virtual camera that you'll see in the application so that you can actually see the person interacting with uh, what's around them. So I think that's pretty cool. We wanna show you how to actually do that. After that, we are going to start the beginning of a series of projects or a project that is a series that is going to be creating first to start some very basic items that we're going to sculpt and also paint and develop into a scene over time. That scene would be the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. So we're going to create a whole bunch of mushrooms today to start off, or at least one mushroom, maybe block out the shape for the caterpillar. And over the coming weeks, we will refine the various elements that make up a whole scene. Because um, Joe, Joe is here helping me out with, uh, with Open Broadcaster and making sure that I am behind the item or in front of the item at the correct time, which is hugely helpful. And we were talking a little bit earlier about how we haven't seen a lot of scenes done in Canova just yet. And we wanna show that off to you folks. So let me go ahead and come over here and grab my headset which by the way, you can see the cable coming down from the ceiling. Uh, if you have a VR headset and you're using Canova or Beat Saber or Fallout 4, or whatever you like to play around with in VR, running your cables from the ceiling is absolutely glorious. So give me one second. And also we have Ed with us here today, who's gonna be really running a lot of the conversation while I'm sculpting things and keeping everything on track. And if you work with Moto, you already know Ed, he's amazing. So say hello, Ed. Oh, thanks, Greg. Yeah, so I'm, I'm here as well. Uh, I'm reading the chat, so if you guys have any questions, I'll definitely pass it along to Greg so that uh, he can concentrate on sculpting. And uh, I'm hearing that there was an echo in the beginning, uh, but it's gone now. Keep me updated on that, and uh, we'll, try to, we'll, we'll just try to uh, adjust and uh, you know, correct things as, they, as this moves along. It seems like uh, people are pretty excited about the mushroom topic, so that's pretty good. It should be pretty interesting to uh, actually have a, a scene uh, in Canova. It's, it's actually, it excels at that sort of uh, sculpting. Okay, all right, so I am now inside of Canova, and what you're seeing right now, of course, is me composited behind the sphere, and I wanna talk to you about how we actually set that up. So first off, if I come over here, to Canova on my desktop, which you won't be able to see me do, but you'll see my mouse moving and get Joe to move over a little bit. <laughs> so what I have going on right now is to allow for the compositing. First off, I came over and opened a new background. And that background is just a simple image that's green that I can use as a chroma key. And so now you're actually able to see me composited into Canova, which is pretty cool. I'm also using a camera matched background that lets me seem like I'm actually in the application. Now there's a couple things you wanna to do to actually set up a proper mixed reality. So first off, you'll see that I open up this view menu and you wanna turn on visibility for track devices and also <clears throat> to make attachments opaque that will improve the, the quality as far as the, uh, the, the chroma key is concerned. All right, so once I have that, I also wanna come in here and make a few other changes. Camera, I wanna lock the camera to my generic tracker. Now, you can actually set um, any type of device that's being tracked, the HMD, say if you wanna have a video that shows a person working from their, at their perspective, you can show it through the, uh, the HMD, or you can actually attach a controller to a camera and use that as a tracking device. Fortunately, I have one of the actual dedicated trackers and was able to mount that on top of my camera with a G1 quarter adapter that allows it to screw right into place. And so we already have that um, working out for us already, which is super, super cool. Um, but we need to make a few other quick changes as well. 
And so in this case, I want to make sure that I open up my mixed reality capture setup. So if I come over here and you take a look at that mixed reality capture setup, it's already toggled. I have that on another screen already. And this is what's going to show up for you when you see that mixed reality capture setup. Now, I've already gone through the process of setting up some basic aspects. In the case of a dedicated tracker from HTC, you need to actually set the rotation to be 270 degrees around X. And uh, as I start to bring controllers into the view, make sure that they are turned on you can actually see the controllers in space, but they aren't matched up to me. Joe, can you move the mixed reality capture over a little bit to the side of the window? There you go. And so they're not quite working. Now, what you do is you use the mixed reality capture setup panel there or palette to go through and set a variety of settings while you have a person who is holding the controllers in place. Best way to do this is to hold a controller towards the camera and then off to the side. And that way you're actually getting a wider range of the space that these items are occupying. So as you start modifying some of these variables, it's going to improve your ability to actually match these items together. All right, so really quickly, I'm gonna have Joe come over here. And Joe, if you can hold on to these controllers and step into the space. I've done this at this point, it feels like a few hundred times. <laughs> and so I'm going to go ahead and be the person who sets this up. One of the first things I'm going to do actually is come over to the scene panel. This is actually a, uh, a palette that is there by default. We use PyQt for our interface so you can dock and undock. And this is what you would see by default. Typically, I want to actually have this you know, out of the way because I want to have this be viewport centric. And it's also important uh, if you're doing any camera matching because we do want this to take up as close to the real space that the frame actually has. Now, also, I'm going to, I'll just let you see this again really quickly. Um, and I probably don't wanna have the ground plane on and you're gonna actually see this menu in VR once I hop into VR, um, but it's slightly different for um, VR and desktop. So when I turn off the ground plane on desktop, I can actually still see it inside of VR, but it's not going to affect negatively um, the actual capture itself, which it can otherwise. All right, now I'll yank this on over here. So for the mixed reality capture settings, um, one of the things I wanna do first is I wanna go full screen. And so that'll give us as much space as possible. You notice the width is automatically set now to 1918 by 1078, which is rather close. Now we don't need everything to match exactly because we're gonna actually more or less eyeball this. Since I have a tracker that is sitting on top of the camera, it's not actually identifying where the lens is, right? It's floating up above, and that's how we're tracking the location. And so if I want, I can go ahead and pop on in here and say, you know what? I want to offset this 85 millimeters or so. And Joe, if you can point one controller towards and one to the side, Joe's going to get a workout today. Not like he actually needs it because he spends a lot of time in Beat Saber every day doing workouts. <laughs> but you can see how offset this actually is. Um, I think the height is relatively okay. Um, but at this point, what we're going to want to start playing around with are some of the other offset elements, like, for instance, the FOV. Now, you can actually set this via vertical FOV, horizontal FOV, sensor width, or focal length, and you can save these settings for use later. Um, most of the time when you're tracking an item in VR, uh, Joe can speak to this because he's done some Beat Saber <laughs> recording. Look into the camera and sh shake your head. Um, <clears throat> it never matches up the second time you do it. You always have to go back in. And so you kind of go ahead and feel this out like, all right, 70, no, that is not right. 40, yeah, we're getting actually pretty darn close. Can you put your right hand out to your side now? Don't point it at, there we go. And uh, just bring it in a little bit so it's actually in the frame. Uh, not at, not, don't turn it, pull, bend your arm. Yeah, and so I see the side. And it's also helpful to actually see the controller from multiple angles um, when you're doing this to really line it up correctly. And so I'm gonna go ahead and change that over to 80 and 75 and 70. Uh, one thing that we are planning on doing is adding sliders here to make this a little bit easier. So your left hand, can you pull, point your left hand towards the camera? There you go. And put it in the position you just had it before. That's interesting, huh? Looks like what I need to do is offset this just ever so slightly. 
And now that's only two millimeters. 10, no, that's not doing anything for me. Go over here to X, yep, and negative 10. Pretty cool. Put it out at your side um, where I can see, yeah, bend your arm like that. There you go. Perfect, thanks, Joe. And that's actually looking like a decent track there. It's not bad, it's not perfect, but it will it'll suit our purposes. One of the things that's annoying though, is that right now you're seeing uh, a certain amount of latency um, as I actually, or as Joe moves the controller. Now you can actually alter this. Now what I'm doing is I'm using a second computer that is pulling in um, my main desktop on my main computer. And I'm using Open Broadcaster, and I can't show this to you right now, but I'll try and uh, reproduce this for everybody a little bit later so you can actually see what I'm going to go and do. You can actually add filters. And because I'm streaming uh, or pulling in video from another computer, what I actually typically want to do is create a, um, a little bit of a delay. And so I'm going to go ahead and set that. Can you just turn one of the controllers back and forth so I can see him up and down? There you go. Good. I'm going to set that at 200 milliseconds. And that's almost there. And filters again. 300 milliseconds. No, that's going in the opposite direction now. And filters again. And so 250. And let's see how that's doing. So nice of you to wave at everybody. I'm sure everybody appreciates that, Joe. By the way, Joe uh, is one of our uh, one of the people that supports Moto. He's absolutely exceptional at it. And uh, if you're a Moto user, at some point or another, you may contact Joe. Be nice to Joe. Joe's nice. All right. <clears throat> and let's uh, go Greg, really quickly, yeah. there have there have been some questions about sure. um, how difficult this is to set up if uh, if you don't have a Joe in, in your house. Uh, well, uh, this is the first time I've had a Joe <laughs> actually to set this up with. Um, the uh, the actual the promo video marketing video that is on the Canova page on Steam. Um, I pretty much did that all alone as far as setting up the tracking. Um, what you end up doing is you, what I did is I, I set up a bunch of items on the green screen that Joe is standing on right now, one that was close to the camera, one that was far away, and just set the trackers on those items, or the controllers on those items, and then matched it and looked at it on my other screen. And so it wasn't too bad. I'd say um, once I got familiar with it, it took five minutes. The first time, <clears throat> it probably took an hour just because, you know, you're getting familiar with, you know, what you expect. And like for these settings right here, I mean, the offset of 70 millimeters, it ranges when I, when I set this up sometimes between 60 and 95. Um, every single time I have to set it up ever so slightly differently. Um, that also probably could be solved some other uh, other things that could be done to make this a little bit more streamlined, but this is the initial implementation of this, and this will work pretty well for us. So I'm going to cool. go ahead and close. Uh, mm -hmm. One more thing, Greg. So it, it's really not about um, like the body type doesn't matter because you're just um, like it, because you guys are different sizes and everything. It's really yeah. just about tracking the controllers, and that's it, right? Exactly, precisely. Okay, and we're pretty close. He's six foot. I'm five eleven. We're not far, but yeah, it doesn't matter. One of the people that helped me out in the past was like five foot, and uh, mm -hmm. she did a great job. And so one of the other things we want to do is come back to this view menu. You can see this view menu allows you to uh, make a lot of things visible in the actual, uh, in the desktop viewport in particular. And so like right now I can see my generic trackers and stuff like that. That can be useful while you have the HMD on also. Um, what I want to do though, is I want to make sure I don't show controllers. And now what we have is um, go ahead and increase the size of the brush really quickly. There you go. And so we only are seeing the brush tip um, with the real world controllers. Now it's not always entirely accurate as far as when it would be overlaying or you know in front or behind the actual controllers themselves. Um, but it at least makes it so that you actually have your brushes in a location relative to the controllers that is more or less accurate. And so it's one of the things that we're kind of proud of because uh, I mean, it was something I needed to make some videos, um, but we invested a little bit of time in mixed reality capture because streaming is super popular now. And uh, we're seeing, for instance, in the case of Beat Saber in particular, um, lots of mixed reality streams because it's not very hard to set up your own green screen. Um, if people want to 
uh, talk about setting up a green screen, I have a pretty crazy setup here. It's a modular green screen and uh, I can flip it up and down. I can even move it into the living room, which I'm going to see how my roommate feels about that. Um, but I, uh, the apartment I got was actually, um, I got it partly because I was like, oh, wow, I can make a modular living room that immediately converts into a studio with about 15 minutes of effort. So if anybody wants to talk about how to set up that green screen, you just let me know. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. And I'm gonna actually show you how to sculpt a mushroom and paint a mushroom just to get us started off. All right, and there we go. Thank you so much, Joe. And now Joe is gonna go back to his compositing tasks and we'll see how that goes. It's one of the things that is Frustrating is, you know, as this technology uh, evolves, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to detect what's in front and behind and maybe some of these, um, some of the software that's engineered for um, actually doing the mixed reality setup for you will be capable of actually matching everything up. Uh, does it actually do front, in front and behind automatically? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit, really? I thought well, you need cool. stereo cameras maybe for that was what I was thinking. And if you guys like, you know, really ask nicely, I bet maybe you could actually persuade Joe to show himself playing Beat Saber at some point, uh, specifically Ganyam style. I want to <laughs> see you. I want to see you play Ganyam style. That's what I was doing for my workout this morning. It's humiliating but brutal. Um, all right, uh, Greg. Really yeah. quickly, um, there was one other question about whether this is um, HTC Vive only, or if this will work with the Oculus Rift as well. This works with the Oculus Rift, and it also works with the Windows uh, Mixed Reality headsets. Um, that is something that we recently added because when we first released Canova as early access on Steam, uh, we focused only on the Rift and uh, the Vive, and then a bunch of Mixed Reality users were like, "No, we want this too." And it's not exactly a, a huge user base yet but we want to try and accommodate as many people as possible. So now we support the Windows Mixed Reality headsets. And uh, just real quickly, Joe, can you see my menu? Yes. Yes, okay, cool. All right, and so I'm gonna go ahead and eliminate some of the problems that I created here, which are right there. And uh, you're not gonna see this because right now in this menu, if I come over to the scene settings, you can, I can turn on things like follow surface. We covered some of this stuff in the first uh, Canova webinar. And, uh, but I can also um, make some changes to how things are being uh, physically displayed. And so I wanna be able to have my sculpting bounds on because right now what I see is a six by six space that is my current layer. And uh, I want to be able to see that. And I also have my ground plane, which just helps with a little bit of perspective right now. And if I hop on over into layers, you can see that I have my current layer. I really don't need this sphere. Um, it's a good starting point. It's approximately 30 centimeters in height, uh, or I guess we'll say 30 centimeters in diameter. But I can just go in there and erase that out by using the sphere brush with erase on. And now I have a nice clean, empty space to work with. Now, just to talk about some of the niceties of um, working with volumetric clay like this, um, it's super cool because I can do all sorts of really neat things. I turn erase off and I make my brush, I'll just go ahead and make this a little bit larger. And I just go ahead and spray. I should be entirely blocked from the camera right now. Is that correct, Joe? Yes. All right. And now you can't see it, or maybe you can, I doubt it. Um, I can go ahead and turn on erase and I can just carve through this. This is just crazy. And this is something that I don't take advantage of enough when I show off Canova. It's one of the cooler aspects of the technology, the ADF technology behind Canova is that, I mean, it's just completely fluid. It's like real you know, materials in the real world and that I can just punch holes through it and eliminate stuff and it's super cool. And I also, um, which is something else I don't show off often enough, is actually change the color. And what if I wanted this to go over here and maybe I wanted to raise the metallic, I can modify that ever so slightly. And I can go ahead and pop on in here and turn my erase off and go ahead and just paint with other colors. And that's merge. Those are not two separate layers. And so now if I come over here into the smooth brush, this is super cool. 
I know Ed loves the blending of colors because Ed immediately, when we started playing around with Canova, started playing around with color. Um, but you can see, I'm actually leaning through this oh, yeah. thing. Now, that actually Greg, really blends. quickly, um, I, sh I should mention that um, if you paint with green, it actually gets uh, oh, uh, mat matted out. Yeah. <laughs> of course so. it does. All yeah. right, we'll undo that. That was dense. And so let's go ahead and undo and undo. It's performing so nicely. All right, let's get rid of that green material. Nice and also in up. the uh, in the color wheel, uh, it might look like there's a, a like a quarter of the color wheel that's actually black, but obviously that's yep, just that's the green part green. of the color. Wheel. That's something yep. else we've got to figure out how to actually deal with, I suppose. Um, all right, so now I'll come back over here to sphere, and we'll just go ahead and make that a little bit smaller, and go ahead and line that right there. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and step around this, Joe. If you can switch the order and confirm for me if it actually it did successfully switch. All right, cool. And then I'm gonna come over here to smooth. And now as I smooth this out, you see how that blends together? And so super cool. And one of the things we focus a lot of effort on is feel um, in VR in particular, um, because most of the VR sculpting apps we tried, they're amazing, but it seemed like for actual sculpting and not kit bashing, the feel wasn't quite right just yet. And we wanted to try and nail that down to create a really good sculpting application in VR. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select the scene. Okay, did you drop me behind again? Dude, you're awesome. All right, so when I come over here to the actual scene option, um, now I'm actually focusing on the scene itself. Uh, or I can actually select the layer. And if I go ahead and create a new layer, it's going to nest or parent underneath the existing layer. This is going to be useful later. We're going to focus on a single layer for now, but then we're going to split it apart. And even at later stages, when we have limbs on our caterpillar for this owl, so one of the land scene, um, since the limbs would be on separate layers, we could actually pose the limbs and stuff and say if there are separate layer with fingers, that would follow along. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer so I have something entirely new to work with. And you can see that when I create that new layer, I have a have new settings on my, my material. So it goes back to that kind of flesh color itself. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of torn. I, I think I'm probably going to actually start off with the, the kind of fleshy color, maybe move that a little bit towards white um, because I'm going to start off with the actual physical base of the mushroom itself. Um, now, since I've got this space in front of me right now, and it's going to be a little bit hard for you guys to, to see everything um, on the ground because I don't have enough space to actually show you that, I'm going to go ahead and lift this up, which you also can't see. But now I've got basically the base of my space um, right here at my hip level. And can you see my brush right now, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yes? How far is that from the bottom of the window? It's right at the edge. Perfect. All right, cool. And let's go ahead and come on down here. I'll hop on over to Sphere. And by the way, Ed, interrupt me whenever if people have questions or comments or anything. Definitely. All right. So now I have a Sphere in place. And this is just super cool because I can just start making the actual base of my shape. And how close am I to the top? You're right there. I'm right there. All right. Now I can move it back down if I wanted to. But I also could come over here to layers and reset it, and now it's back at its original origin. If you have items parented, like under this layer, what if I had a second layer that was the cap? We might as well do that, right? Um, once it's parented underneath, if I go back and I transform the actual stem itself, the cap will follow along, and if I tell it to reset, they'll all reset back to the correct location relative to one another, which is great. And so now let's go ahead and create that new layer. There we go. And let's also change the material over to something reddish. Now we're going to do some painting on this after the fact um, because we're going to want to add more variation to the color. But why not start with a base color that is going to actually fairly closely resemble what we're going for. And actually, let's do this two ways because the bottom, the underside of the mushroom is going to be white. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just start painting this out, which is so cool to be working in the real world uh, like this. And let's take a look underneath. And I actually have pointed the controller. You might not be able to see this line. It might get keyed out. But you see I can point at an individual element, and I can actually move that individual element and undo that at any point in time. 
And so now I've got this base in place, and you know what I'm, what I'm seeing here? I wanna make sure I am on the correct layer, yes. I'm currently naming, by the way, you'll need to do that on the desktop side. We don't have a keyboard in place yet, but we will. And I wanna just give this a little bit more volume down here so I am able to actually smooth this out afterwards and make it a little bit more concave. All right, cool. So this is gonna take a while, the whole project, because I just committed myself to making a whole crap load of mushrooms and blades of grass and environmental elements, maybe like a, you know, the base of a tree trunk and a caterpillar, um, maybe smoking a hookah, we'll see. So let me come over here to my tools and grab my smooth brush and I can just go ahead and flip this any direction that I want to. I also can change the scale as I wish, which is super, super awesome. And let's see if I come over here to layers at any point in time, I can also reset my camera, which allows me to reset my scale. And this is very important. And so make sure, yes, I am on the smooth brush. And you can see right now that I'm able to smooth this clay out, all these very blocky forms really quickly and really easily. And I'm pointing at the stem so that I am transforming the actual um, whole mushroom from the stem itself. Oops, didn't wanna grab that, but get it back into place rather easily. And we'll go ahead and start smoothing this out a little bit more. There we go, bring that on down. And when you smooth, you are in oftentimes reducing the amount of detail uh, because when you see kind of these creases, this is because right now I do not have smooth blend on. That is smooth blend blends between your various strokes. Um, we're adding extra resolution at these contact points to allow for that definition. And this is one of the things that we were really excited about with uh, ADF technology, with what we can achieve with it. Um, but it's not something you always want. Um, Ed and I also found, as we were playing with the application more and more, that we really uh, liked having the smooth blend off a lot of times uh, because you're just blocking out quick shapes and you're able to then go in and smooth on top of it. And the smooth is, I mean, it really is my favorite brush by far. And so I'm gonna pop over to layers. Vil really nailed the behavior of this one down. I think that had to do with a few videos um, that we showed him as far as the importance of smooth and form creation. It is hugely important. Now, I really don't wanna have it be too strong because I do actually want this uh, to be a little bit lumpy. You know, it's a mushroom. It gives it that more organic uh, kind of form, right? Exactly. Now I may go after the fact, and I'm well, definitely gonna go after the fact and add more detail in here. Um, but I'm okay with the general lumpiness of this. And I'm gonna come over here now to my layers again and grab my layer. And I'm gonna turn my smooth way up. And if you just click on this slider, it will increase by increments of 10. You were about to say something, Ed? Well, uh, there's this request. Uh, the Nordic Hunter wants you to say happy little clouds uh, in the Bob Ross voice. I don't I have a necessary. fro, man. I don't have a fro. <laughs> and I also don't have an open shirt, and I really don't have much chest hair. Um, but okay. There, we'll there go, is something nice we, about, we will... about uh, sculpting, <laughs> sculpting roughly and uh, happy kind of little, smoothing after the fact. I, don't, I just don't know if I'm comfortable with saying happy little mushrooms either. But <laughs> eventually, maybe we'll get onto some happy little clouds. Um, but you do have a point. I mean, what if Bob Ross had this technology? That would be... Oh, yeah. That would have been interesting. That man... It was, I'm sorry, what were you saying, Joe? Move it to your left a bit. Move it to my left. So towards you? No, rotate to your left. Like that? Your left. Oh, my left. Yes, like that? No. Rotate to my left. That's like this. Right there. Really? Yeah. So that's, okay. Hello, people. Ah, there we go. It's amazing how easily you get lost in this. So this is all behind me. And am I still in frame? Cool. All right. And uh, don't hesitate, those of you who are watching this, to remind me of this. It's extraordinary how quickly you can get, like, just completely lost. 
All right, now that we have that in place, and I'm gonna go ahead and switch my material over to something a little bit reddish. Let's get that to be a little bit more of a maroon, make it a little bit more natural. Like I said, we will be adding more color after the fact. And I will bring this down so it glows, goes below the ground. Now, um, let's go ahead and trim that out a bit. Uh, I actually used to work with clay quite a lot, um, especially when I was in high school. I had an amazing sculpture teacher, Gershon Rappaport, and he uh, let me take lots of tools home to the point that my parents were uncomfortable because they thought I was stealing from the school. Um, but I ended up accumulating huge amounts of clay. I think I had 800 pounds of clay in my parents' sure, basement. Wow. Yeah, and I was like reclaiming the clay as well. And so I had all these plaster blocks. And so I'd be able to reclaim the actual clay. And, you know, I tried to make a full-size human figure in my parents' basement. Um, that was quite a project. I never <laughs> finished it, which is not exactly a surprise. Uh, let's see. Whoop. Pull that up. But it's amazing to actually, I, I like working big. I made a, an eight foot stick shift for an art project in college. Um, but uh, it was amazing to suddenly actually have something that relative to my scale is absolutely gigantic. And I can't help but geek out over it a little bit. And that's the advantage of VR, right, Greg? I mean, that's what's so nice about it is you can you can work in uh, at that large scale. Yeah, well, that that is that is part of it, and then also, I mean, you know, it's stereo. I mean, stereo on a desktop just really doesn't quite do what you'd want it to undo. And whoops, undo. Um, but having depth and that sense of depth is absolutely wonderful. Um, so I'm going to come on over here to my smooth brush again, and we'll go ahead and start roughing these out. Right now it's rather boring, but it will improve over time. And if, this is something we debated quite a bit, and we'll just go full disclosure with you guys. Ed and I talked about it quite a lot, and we talked to a lot of other people quite a lot. We wanted to do a three-hour stream, um, and because it's so hard to show something substantial in three hours. In one hour, it's just about impossible. Um, so instead, what we've decided to do is actually, um, you know, split up a project into multiple streams and try and do it one hour by one hour. But we're definitely receptive to hearing from you folks um, what your tolerance is. I mean, we do live in a time where a five-minute YouTube video doesn't always get watched all the way through. Um, so we want to hear more about what you guys want to see because I'm just that kind of nerd that will actually watch something for that long um, if it's something that I'm interested in. Yep, same here. Yeah, well, obviously, Ed, we've <laughs> all been seeing your work. You've been doing great. If you guys want to see a great presentation from Ed, go and check out the Nomon Live, I think, video for Modo um, from, I think it was just over a year ago, right? Maybe a year Yeah, and it was a... Uh... February 2017. There you go. Yeah. Check it out. It's it was a fun time. Dude, you did a great job showing the procedural modeling along with mesh fusion for jewelry design. Yeah. That cool. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. It was good. That's okay. Thanks, Joe. But I'm not going to be able to do much about it all the time. Um, now, Greg, you are drifting a little bit off screen uh, right now. Joe just warned me. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Yeah. And it, that is uh, going to happen to some degree. Um, is the mushroom still on screen, Joe? Half of it. Half of it. So to my left? Yep. All right. I think it's time to make the modular living room studio. I'd be able to get full body shots and stuff because there'd be so much more space. And my roommate is receptive because he saw Beat Saber, and he definitely doesn't want Beat Saber to be in my room because he wants to play it. <laughs> it's the gateway VR. Uh, it Apple. really is. It is so good. I mean, I'm probably people are going to probably start hating that I keep on talking about VR fitness, but I am seriously passionate about it at this point. I hate cardio, and I do cardio every morning at 7.30 now. Like so said, there, there have been some uh, questions about, um, I just want to clarify that there's also a desktop mode. You can also use yep. uh, a Wacom Cintiq or any, any tablet. Correct. Um, 
And uh, there was a question that Cindy Groves asked about uh, arm fatigue, if, if there is uh, any fatigue when you, when you work for long periods. Uh, a year ago, there definitely was. Um, I can kind of feel it now, uh, but I, 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 I'm, I've been doing a lot more exercise in the past year, so like, that's gotten better. Um, I oftentimes find after 30 minutes, 40 minutes, if I block something out, because doing blocking something out while you're standing is, I think, the best way to do it, uh, to get proportions and scale right. I usually gravitate um, to a chair, and I work in a chair and just sit there. Um, in fact, actually, my cables that I, I have coming down from the ceiling right now have two different tracks, one that leads to my desk and the one that leads here to the center of my room. And so, let's see. I have to say, the top of the mushroom is, is really looking... Um, Mushroomy? Yep, it totally that is. That is. And is that in view, actually, right now? This is one thing I've, I've uh, been talking a lot about uh, internally is we need a, a quick way to throw something out into space. Um, because one thing you will notice working in VR is you really want to be able to see it from a distance frequently. I mean, if you were working in the real world, you know, if, with clay and something large, you'd get up close, tweak some things, and then you'd step away. And most people don't have enough room to actually do that. Um, in their in their apartments, and so it's very important to be able to get it away from you so you can really look at it. Um, you know, also would be cool maybe even to. I mean, by the way, I'm talking about things that are not in the application, but I think it's worth discussing a little bit. Um, also, it might be cool to have like a screen that could show it from another angle or behind you from far away or something like that. Definitely, it's like almost like when you're sculpting or drawing, and you have like a little mirror that you use. You look into the mirror yeah. uh, to kind of see the. It's kind of like a left brain, right brain sort of thing, where you get a whole different perspective of what you're working on. You know, that's what I do in Moto. I think I'm one of the few people that actually does do some sculpting in Moto. Moto's multi-resolution tools are much better than people think they are. They're incredible. I agree. Actually, um, they're capable of quite a bit. Um, but one of the things I do is I duplicate my viewport. And I have a second viewport because of our you know, deferred renderer, essentially, which is our, our advanced viewport, um, allows you to see a model from multiple angles. And so I'll have one from a three quarter from a distance where I see the whole thing, but then I'm zoomed in and working on the head. It's uh, a workflow aspect I think is absolutely incredible. Now, Louise had a question, uh, Louise Marroquin, uh, is there a way to use button combinations to activate tools in order to not use the menu so much? Um, this is something that we've been talking about quite a bit. We haven't committed to it entirely. Um, we've discussed, you know, something resembling pie menus, things of that sort. There are actual controls that allow you to grab specific things like switching to subtract, um, grabbing and dropping. By the way, I'm hitting this button right here on the side of the trackpad to expand or collapse it. Um, you know, like follow surface and stuff like that. But all the main brushes, no, not yet. Um, but we think that the best way to handle that would probably be through a pie menu type UI. And uh, that is something that will probably not be or definitely won't be in the first version um, because UI for VR is challenging. Um, something that's cool, I showed this with Moto VR, is any of the concepting that we've done for VR UIs, we've concepted in Moto VR. Uh, the reason being is that Moto's rigging system uh, with Moto VR, you can actually attach something to a controller and then you can create rigs that actually perform animations and, uh, and actually with command regions become uh, uh, actual buttons you can push and perform scripted actions with. And so, you know, we've actually played around with various UIs and this is something you can already do in Moto VR for say, for instance, like you have a car scene that you wanna to show to a client, you can actually make a UI that is usable by that client to switch colors and stuff like that. That's actually in uh, last, last summer's SIGGRAPH presentation for Moto. Let me go and get a little bit further out. Cool, that is a lumpy mushroom. That is, that should be a lumpy. All right. All right, cool, I'm off on the side. It's amazing how comfortable I've gotten in VR over the past uh, oh, almost two years now, but more like a year and a half. One of the first times I used it, um, I got real sick. <laughs> <laughs> and now it seems like I'm in here all the time and every morning I'm jumping like, I'm jumping around like a freak idiot. 
um, which yeah, helps Yeah, definitely. Too. The more time you spend in it, it, it definitely you become uh, acclimated to it for sure. Yes, that you know that's a, a very good way of putting it too. Is that you need to develop that acclim that acclimation. Like if you are interested in VR and you're like, well, I don't know, I get kind of ill. You will get over it as long as you're an adult. Um, what you need to do is just hop in for 20, 30 minutes at a time or less and just slowly build that up. And over time, it gets much better. And I actually just recently read a, a review from somebody on Facebook saying that the uh, the audio head strap for the Vive really helps a lot as far as comfort is concerned. All right, so now I am in uh, paint mode and I'm gonna go ahead and turn the strength way on down. These are toggles for pressure sensitivity, won't matter that much. But you can see what I'm doing here is I've got you know, a little bit of blending going on where I'm actually adding a little bit of variation to the color. And so I'll go ahead and rotate this around. Um, also, you're able to use either controller. This is another thing we debated hotly as far as whether or not one controller should be a dedicated menu controller um, or not. And uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, probably should have everything accessible through both. Um, just because it's nice to be able to switch back and forth. There are, I mean, I'm a lefty, and there are times I end up using my right hand. And so now let's come on over here. Materials again. Let's get a little bit more brighter orange in there. And uh, bring the strength down a little bit less. Now, the Nordic Hunter had a question uh, about the brushes. He he knows that, you know, mushrooms have kind of a, a sharp detail underneath on their kind of underside of, yes. of the cap. Um, and he was asking if the brushes will be able to handle that. Yep. And that is because of the local resolution, it will. Um, that is something that I probably will do on the desktop side of things, just because I'll have finer control on my uh, regular tablet. Um, and so, yeah, yes, I will have that detail in place. Um, that's the thing. With Canova, the things that make it the most interesting uh, to me are the local resolution and VR capabilities, of course. Um, I also like the ability to, of course, be able to punch holes, just the freeform aspect of it, of it all. But what you'll find is that the local resolution aspect of it all is probably best uh, taken advantage of on the desktop side because you can really go in there and fine tune details. Now, something we need to talk about more, and I think I showed in the first video, is the um, actual INI file, the uh, preferences INI file for Canova. You can go in there and actually change a LUT for the, um, the actual behavior of how a brush responds, like how strong it is, um, how, you know, and things of that sort, or the range for the strength that you actually see here in this menu. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, this is something that we want to expose in the actual application itself more, of course, too. But yeah, I'll be able to add that detail and you will see that happen. Probably not today. You'll probably see that next week because I'll probably add that during the week on the desktop side. And then next week we'll spend more time in desktop and probably from that point forward do bouncing back and forth between desktop and VR mode. Now, Greg, do you, do you find yourself strength. more uh, doing like the, the broader strokes and uh, the primary forms in VR and then moving over to desktop for the exactly. secondary, tertiary Absolutely. Forms? Cool. And you'll see a lot more of that once I got onto the, the Caterpillar. And I think you and I both separately started doing the same thing, which was, uh, you know, doing these broad shapes in VR, but um, on a single layer and then hopping in uh, or actually just cutting apart a single layer into multiple different layers which you can do which we will be going over because that is a very important workflow consideration and that's okay i'm probably spending a little bit too much time on on this aspect here but this is cool can you guys see that i think so and i'm gonna hop on over here into tools and smooth and I'll go ahead and smooth this out a little bit. Now, one thing that we're working very heavily on, and uh, I'm just not going to pretend like it's not there, you'll see a little bit of divoting. Um, that happens oftentimes after you smooth the surface and, and kind of, well, you, you've added lots and lots of different clay on top of a surface. That is something that we are very actively investigating. Um, but these are the early stages. And volumetric stuff is challenging and ADF makes it that much more challenging. Uh, but we were making some pretty great headway. Actually, over the past uh, three weeks, uh, the improvements have been pretty spectacular. Um, Bill added mixed reality support. Uh, we also reduced our file sizes by like 50%. We reduced memory usage by about the same. Bill um, just keeps on finding areas of the code that he can continue 
ref can continue refining. And it's kind of amazing how far he's come inside that time. Now, Greg, when you say mixed reality headsets are supported now, it's a little bit different from the mixed reality presentation that you're doing now. You're actually talking Correct. about the headsets. Windows MR. Windows MR is an actual kind of not product line, but technology line, I suppose. They come from many different headset makers like Asus and Samsung. Um, and so we wanted to support some other pieces of hardware. So did anybody actually hear, by the way, that... Uh, Let's go ahead and reset that. You see how that went right back to where it was supposed to? Um, Pimax is a headset that I'm very curious about. I'm very curious to see what people say about it. Apparently, it has now been shipped to some early reviewers. And we'll actually hear how good that is pretty soon. Is that the one that's like 8K? It's not 8K. That's, okay. that is, that, well, yeah, it's called the Pimax 8K. Um, <laughs> but it's not AK. Uh, Linus Tech Tips has uh, a, a really good video on it. I mean, he's he's just brutal and unrelenting and honest about everything. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, but uh, it's actually two 4K displays. So it's resolution-wise, it's closer to 6K, and there's all these various versions of it. But it has a super wide field of view, and it is much higher resolution. I wonder whether or not my hardware could even run it. Um, but, uh, it's something that is, is definitely interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and switch on over here to ribbon and ribbon, as you can see, I think you can see that, that flattened side, there's a curved side and a flattened side. And so ribbon will allow you to get this nice flat shape right there. And I want to use that here on the actual mushroom surface itself, but I want to switch my material around to something that is almost white. And maybe get that offset because you never want anything to be totally perfectly white. And I can go ahead and change that. By the way, I'm changing the scale of my brush by sliding it here on the trackpad. And so let's go ahead and get this a little bit smaller. I don't want this to be too organic anyway. I'll go ahead and oops, make a whole bunch of these. You know what? I'm actually going to undo that. I'm going to show something else here. So if I come over here to Tools and Follow Surface, and I push that away in space. How is that in frame, Joe? Uh, center left. Left? No, you were good. I was good? Yeah, it was center left. Oh, okay, cool. And there you go. Can you just shut that off? All right, so now what I've got is follow surface mode on, and I'm gonna go ahead and use the ribbon brush itself. And you can see that I've actually got this display from a distance. Now, what I probably want to do here is I probably want to come over here into my radius and reduce that quite, well, not, not the radius, excuse me. I want to reduce the strength. I don't want, I want it to do a little bit more of a, a build up. Get that way down there and raise that on up. You can see now I'm actually spraying clay from a distance. And uh, let's go ahead and I'm not getting my display on this one right now, but there we go. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Luis, uh, can you do retopology in Canova or do we have to export that to Moto? Uh, that's definitely a job for Moto. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that, I mean, yeah, that's just something that Moto is amazing at, period. So, yes. And also, uh, I mean, uh, we are trying to make sure that we are supporting um, OBJ vertex colors and things of that sort so that stuff can come over to Moto more easily. Because, I mean, really, the way that this would be exported is as a, um, a you know a vertex color and our main export format is obj right now all right so greg uh at the moment i'm looking at your back and it's kind of hard to see uh your controller uh, but it looks like you're kind of using the the laser sight to kind of spray on uh, yes i'm using the spots. follow surface mode to be from a distance and kind of get different spots that are different sizes and i'm trying to be as liberal as i can without completely being uh without my OCD completely um, making me <laughs> want to actually make these perfect, which is a little bit harder. But yeah, I'm just spraying these spots on and remember that I am actually spraying it on the active layer right now. And so let's go ahead and come on over here. So technically those spots are on a different layer, but they're no. using the underlying layer. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is the same layer. Now that is something, a good point that you just brought up though, is that if you create a new layer, and you have geometry in a background layer, um, follow surface mode on desktop or, or actually 
um, even without it, but uh, on desktop or in VR will follow the background surface itself. And so you can actually build things, uh, you know, one layer on top of another um, as kind of a background reference. It kind of auto constrains, it just does that. All right, let's see. There we go. Okay, that is looking all right. And I'll come over here and smooth. And I don't want follow surface mode on anymore. We'll take a look. It's okay if I'm out of frame. I don't matter. The mushroom matters. It's all about the mushroom. All right, so now I'm actually smoothing this and it has the advantage of also kind of blending around, which is nice. I actually like that. I also could come back in and paint on top of it after the fact. And, you know, I can even reduce it to almost be totally flat here. And it's pretty cool how much you can do just by blending multiple surfaces together. Go ahead and get that in there. And by the way, this will look much better by next week because this is an hour long stream. And like I said, we talked a lot about how long it takes to sculpt something and how short all of our attention spans are these days, <laughs> except for Ed, right? Uh, all right. <laughs> It's funny, uh, we Stupid mentioned it last head. week, but sometimes, you know, uh, you sculpt and you might do like a three hour session and sometimes things don't start to look decent until the final 20%, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's usually it's the case. Yeah. yeah. But I definitely, are you know saying my mushroom guys... doesn't look decent? Is that what you were saying, Ed? <laughs> no, the mushroom looks great. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Uh -huh. My sculpts. I think, you're actually I think that's what you were saying, man. <laughs> and it's kind of cool. You notice that I'll, uh, I'll end up, you know, like kind of shaking the controller, but this is almost like old instincts coming along uh, when, we, when we were working on the marketing video. Had some guys from the Austin office helping me out. And as I was uh, working on something a lot like this, actually, um, he was kind of laughing because I was like clicking and stroking like this and letting go. And it's kind of like it became instinctual to kind of like slowly reduce areas. And you just start using different motions uh, to make that actually happen. Um, one thing this will remind you of is it's time to go to the gym. <laughs> it really does. It's one of the best things about VR. Uh, another thing that was really interesting, because uh, one thing I think I mentioned in one of the other webinars was I was um, a, a naysayer when we really started working on stuff like this, like with Moto VR, because I'm like, I just can't imagine a professional actually using it. You know, sure, it's cool. You know, I was being kind of a jerk because I was assuming I... I, I could imagine what that would be like. I'm like, oh, you know, I, I went to school for sculpture and I did a lot of sculpture when I was young with clay. I get it, I get it. And I was completely wrong. Um, it actually, I think it's surprisingly practical and even ways of being able to manage things like cords and cables right here. If you can have it hanging from your ceiling, that's great. It's also best if you're in a chair, it really is. You just need to get far enough away from your screen that you don't knock coffee over on your computer. Um, not that I did that last week, I swear. I've definitely uh, bumped my knee on things and uh, uh, swung into my ceiling fan. I've done a bunch of crazy stuff. So. See, I'm afraid that I keep on like jumping when I'm in Beat Saber and, uh, and there is a ceiling fan above me and I'm just terrified I am going to hit that because a buddy of mine, when the Wii came out, like I came over to a friend of mine's house and there was Rich with this giant bandage taking up half his arm. And it's like, what happened? It's like wee bowling. And he just got way too into it and broke the, the ceiling light above him and ended up having to get, I think, 45 stitches. <laughs> like, oh, no. Yes. He just, just went straight up and ended up hitting that lamp and broke the lamp. And this his hand kept on moving. And sheesh. <laughs> So, you know, that is something about VR that you do have to ma uh, you know, remain conscious of your environment. And you see, right now what I'm doing is I'm adding additional color to these spots. Yeah, yeah because uh, the Nordic Hunter said that uh, he thought it looked a little bit blurry uh, rather than smooth. And he was asking if that was because the colors were mixing as you were smoothing uh, with the smooth yes. brush. Yes, that is exactly right. And so, yeah, I'm coming in on top. And at any point in time... I'd also be able to actually, uh, like for instance, if I just pop this up, like what if I wanted to use the eyedropper, I can go ahead and use the eyedropper to um, actually grab that color. And let's go ahead and come on, go ahead and grab that and then be able to paint over it. That's not working for me. 
uh, but you can use the eyedropper to pick up a color on a surface and then I could continue to actually physically refine it. Now the mushroom is uh, off screen again, Greg. Uh, it's a... Uh... Is it really? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm right. right. I'm like right in front of the camera. <laughs> Joe, just throw stuff at me, man. The Nordic Hunter also said uh, it would be really cool if this could be done with gloves rather than handheld controllers. So you that, know what? Uh, closer Completely to completely hear you, dude. Like, yeah. I mean, the future of control systems uh, is going to be uh, really what makes VR in the coming years. Um, like things like the Rift touch controllers. There's actually really cool things you can do with the finger motions and like like gestures and stuff. Um, that is going to change things dramatically. Uh, right now, we're dealing with this early stage of this technology and the early controllers um, that go along with it. And uh, that is only going to improve. But yeah, like there's been a lot of very interesting examples of like hand control, hand based controllers and stuff like that uh, recently that people have kind of shown off. Definitely. I think it's only a matter of time before this, you know, there's just a lot more options yep. for, for input. Yep. And Ed, did you see that post I put up on, uh, on our, uh, our, our uh, work website. I, I I didn't click on it, but it, lo it looked interesting. The uh, the AI. So it was like it was the headset would trick your brain so you didn't walk into obstacles. Yeah, you could have a small room and it would it, like yeah. I don't quite understand how it does it, um, but it would trick you into you know being able to or into turning in a small room but not feeling like you're turning. So you could actually walk around a much larger virtual environment and feel like you actually are walking around it. Because I think most people uh, who have played around with VR have had the experience of like, yeah, this is really more of a stationary thing. I'm going to take a guess on how it works. I think when you get really? close to a wall, the headset tightens. No, I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that the headset great, causes though. you pain and you respond in kind. <laughs> right. All right. uh, Metal Gear MK3 says uh, he wants the Nintendo Power Glove compatibility. I see. Um, you know, actually, I just, I, I, I even shouldn't even admit this, but I watched The the Wizard a couple of ah. weeks ago. <laughs> I know, with Fred Savage. Fred Savage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was, dude, I didn't know Christian Slater was in that movie. Oh, I haven't seen it in so long. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, Christian Slater? Oops, all right. It's so funny. Yeah. So really quickly, I'm going to have to save this. This needs to go a little bit further for sure, um, but I need to do a, a quick save. There we go. It is, it is still a little All bit right. off screen, Greg. It's a uh, screen right. Um, so if you pulled the mushroom closer to you and back up, it would be perfect. Yeah, I did. Uh, there's one little bug that we had there that you and I both have run into with the menu when you're selecting a lot of layers in VR. All uh, right. It's suddenly bugging out. One second. Now, uh, Luis asked, uh, can you record shapes in Canova to use it in other projects, like having a library of rocks, plants, et cetera? So that, that's almost like kit bashing, and that's definitely something mm -hmm. that uh, we are very interested in. It, so it is definitely, yet. yeah, that is something we've talked about a lot. Um, it's something that would be hugely useful, obviously, um, and that we want to definitely pursue. Don't know when that's going to be added. Um, but it is part of the conversation virtually every week because, yeah, being able to like model something in Modo or make things in Canova and save those out as individual things um, would be huge, even for, you know, like more like hard surface kit bashing stuff. That'd be wild because uh, we've seen a lot of examples of that with VR applications, right? Using preset meshes um, to build out these much more complex forms. And it's so cool having it like right in front of you. Um, but that is about an hour that we're at right now. And so, uh, yeah, sorry about that one last little bug. We'll, we'll be talking about that on Monday, but it's, uh, you might run into that yourself. So it's good that it's actually shown where after you've clicked a bunch of layers, it sometimes will start bouncing back and forth, but I have my file saved and I can go ahead and continue working on it this week. And next Friday, um, you'll probably see a more well-developed mushroom. And, uh, what we'll do is, I don't know, I, I'm kind of torn on it, whether or not I should show you blocking out the caterpillar or show you detailing the caterpillar on top of that. But it should be a fun project as far as making a lot of stuff and an environment. And uh, in the end, what we'll do is we'll export it all to Modo and do a render of it and maybe play around with a little bit of Retopo stuff in Modo because that is by far my favorite part of Modo is topology and the Topo pen. And let us know what you guys want to see as Please, far as yes. uh, the length of the the, uh, the webinars and, uh, and content even. Yeah, definitely, definitely. 
And where can they, they do that, Greg? That's uh, the, on the Canova page on Steam, right? The yes, discussions section? in the Steam discussions uh, section. That would probably be the, the best place to do that right now. And uh, But otherwise, yeah, please uh, engage us. Let us know what you think about the application, what you want to see from it. Um, I think this technology has huge amounts of potential. Um, we're working very hard on it. And uh, we'd like to, in many ways, collaborate with the community on turning this into something that you want to use every day. So uh, are there any other questions really quickly before we sign off, Ed? Um, there was one by, uh, by Cresshead. He asked, uh, in Canova, can you set up a work area for VR space? I think we, we basically have that. I mean, there is like a... Uh... Yeah, well, I, okay. Yeah, I mean, yes, there is a work area in that each layer has, is a six foot by six foot cube or six by six cube, six by six by six cube. Um, and you, you can move those layers around wherever you want. So that is the, you know, limited workspace for now. That's something that will also evolve over time as we kind of implement more areas of the technology that aren't in there just yet. And then finally, the Nordic Hunter just said he wouldn't mind longer live sessions, but yeah. Uh, you have to let us know in the uh, in the discussion section. That'll, that, that means yeah, a lot. Yeah, exactly. You if, if, you, if there's a thread that says, what you guys want to see from these videos, then, it helps you know, us like, yeah, lot. exactly. Like our boss is totally receptive to pretty much doing anything, but he doesn't want to just hear it from us. <laughs> you know, we're like, we want to do this. And he's like, that's nice that you want to do this. I don't know if the people you're talking to want this. And so that would help us in those discussions. Definitely. And then finally, finally, this has got to be the last one. Um, Metal Gear MK3, he wants to know when the next Canova update is and Honestly, we, I don't think we can say, Greg. There's no answer Not to that. Not really. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we tend to release an update once every two, two weeks. I think the longest was three weeks when Ville had to go away on vacation for a week. But Ville iterates really fast. And when we get a nice little collection of updates that he's done, like the last one that had all sorts of memory improvements and, and, just, uh, and, and storage size improvements, file size improvements, um, we went ahead and pushed that out. So you'll probably see another update to Canova um, very shortly shortly and probably expect to see them every two to three weeks or so as incremental updates. All right. So we good? I think so. Yeah. That, that wraps up all of our questions. Cool. Well, thank you so much for helping Ed and thank you so much, Joe, for, for managing that stream for me and making sure I didn't walk into walls and stuff and uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week and we'll take this further. And hopefully uh, after we have a total of like, you know, five, six, seven hours of, stream streams will have a pretty cool scene that um you know really kind of shows the early aspects of what canova is capable of all right so thanks so much and i'll uh, see you folks next week take care